Hi, it's Dr. Lisa. I realize I don't actually have a name for this show or podcast. Maybe I'll come up with one at some point. <clears throat> but anyway, thanks for watching the first episode uh, last week. Yep. And I got so much feedback. I don't usually get that many comments on videos. So I was like, ooh, I should do another one of these. So I've had something on my mind for a while, which was talking about white men. I don't know if that's a taboo subject. It probably is, but <laughs> that's a good reason for me to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> I was kind of inspired to think about this, talk about this, because I look at our presidential election coming up, and it keeps occurring to me. I'm like, is this the best y'all got? These two? This is the best representation of white men that you have out here right now. Uh, notwithstanding... Tim Waltz seems like a cool guy, but uh, yeah, those two on the Republican ticket are pretty concerning to me, and it makes me really reflect on white men. So we've had white men in, obviously, in positions of power in the United States of America from day one because they created it for themselves. Literally, America was created for them. Uh, one of my favorite metaphysical teachers, Neville Goddard, talks about the founding fathers didn't believe in the future. They believed it in. So they believed a future that they did not have any evidence for, did not have any track record for. There's no such thing like America anywhere on the world. in the world. There still isn't really. Um, and they had a vision that included themselves at the top, and they made it happen. Um, yeah, so that motivates, that idea motivated me in like a bunch of different ways. So a year ago, I was working on something called the Founding Mothers. Uh, one of my issues is I have shiny object sy syndrome, so I tend to move from topic to topic or idea to idea. But, you know, the Founding Mothers was when I was super feeling super passionate, which I still do under a different moniker, um, about women's rights and women's place in the world. And I said, you know, this society that we live in is some, is a creation, like literally America is a creation. It started in minds of a few and it turned into, right now it's the logical conclusion of those, that the minds of the, those few. Um, so I was saying at the time, like, why can't women do that? And I'm still saying the same thing. I've been pushing women this week on LinkedIn to really think about that. And I think in general, I'll say this and I'll get back to my thoughts about white men. I think in general, there is this way that people who are and have been traditionally disenfranchised make a non-specific make use of a non-specific pronoun so they'll say they don't like us or we don't care about us or they don't so and I'm like uh who is they so someone said something like that on LinkedIn about they don't care about black women and I was like who is they because I'm a they I guess I'm not I'm not the author of the post so I care about black women so who are we talking about here? And I think um, it's just one more way that we unconsciously reinforce the power of white men um, in particular, but of white normative androcentric society that makes it bigger and more powerful than it really is. And it is certainly big and powerful and dangerous, which is its primary uh, source of power. Um, but yeah, I think we need to be more careful about using language, um, especially around sort of a non-specified non they um, or view of somebody viewing you. A common problem for women, people of color, in particular double consciousness, because you've got to be aware of the master also while you're hopefully thinking of your own interests. Um, which is often secondary. But anyway, back to white men. So 
the name of the orange person who will not be spoken on this podcast and his little couch loving running mate. No offense to those who love him, but too bad. Kick rocks. Um, it really struck me. I, this is this is pathetic. Like we've had white men running this country, business, um, making policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Literally, as I said, since day one. But there was so much more substance to them than what we see with these two and lots of those other ones who clamor behind them. Um, Yeah, it's real disturbing that this is the highest, you have to assume, the highest expression of white maleness in those two. That's not good. Uh, I think about one of my favorite presidents, who a lot of people did not like, Jimmy Carter. He was a man, he had a heart, and he was able to lead and think of the collective. I think somebody I was talking to recently said, it's difficult for men to think of the collective, but at least in previous years, we did have men who could think of the collective. Even if they were racist, even if they had other stuff going on, which they all did, um, they were able to think of the nation. And uh, this one is thinking about how to stay out of prison, as far as I can tell. Anyway, I don't want to get too far into politics, because I, while I do care about it, especially in this election, you know, it's not particularly a, um, a political podcast, but it is the thing that made me want to talk about white men. I think it's so interesting when we talk about whiteness, when I see people talk about whiteness on social media, we have to use a Y, W-H-Y-T-E, like you can't say white. Like there's so many things that we have to supposedly be careful about to not hurt um, the feelings or offend or something. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there's um, a lot of censorship around talking directly at issues that um, are perpetrated by the oppressor. Yeah, I'm gonna specific, I'm not gonna say they and them, I'll at least say that, which is often white supremacy based, you know, and androcentric based. So focusing on men who are white um, tend to be the ones who we've normed our society around or the society has been normed around. What is normal is that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty weak sauce right now, looking at those two and the other people who parrot behind them. And I guess the ones who are the puppet masters underneath them too. Um, and I can say what I say about white men because I know them. I, for good, mostly, most of my interactions with white men have been positive. Um, but I also can see sort of, you know, I don't just look at my own experiences because most of my experiences with all kinds of people have been good over the course of my life um, because of who I am, my how my stars aligned, I don't know. But um, I can also see sort of larger trends, obviously, and behaviors and hear what other people have to tell me. But, you know, I've, so from the time I was a child, I've had white boys and white boys as friends um, among my friend groups. You know, as a kid, I mostly had girls as friends, but I had boys who were my friends too, for sure, and I played with as a child growing up in Marin County in California. Um, In junior high, high school, college, I certainly had, have had many very dear white male friends. And so I know what they're like. I know how, what their hearts are like. I know that, I mean, the ones who want to be my friends at least are, you know, reasonable, decent people. Uh, they I'm sure have white supremacist notions because everybody does but you know I've seen them up close they have insecurities they've gone through crap they've done they've made mistakes they've fixed their mistakes they've done good things and then I'd also say that um, looking at my career academically going through college and graduate school and then in professionally as well I was thinking about it. I said, all of my opportunities have come through white men promoting me, supporting me, encouraging me, 
my thesis advisor when I was an environmental studies student at UC Santa Cruz in the 90s, um, Jim Pepper. God bless him. I don't even know if he's still alive. I should probably Google that or something. But he supported me. He encouraged me. He lent me his car. Like I had to do my field research in Oakland and I had to go over the hill over the mountains to get there to do the work and he lent me a car for a semester and he lent me a stick shift and he said do you know how to drive a stick I was like yeah I didn't I didn't I drove like down out of his driveway down the street and stalled <laughs> at the stop line and he just sat and stood there on his lawn but I learned how to drive a stick thanks to Jim Pepper thanks dude um, and I ended up with triple honors out of grad out of undergrad for my thesis for my college and from my department. And that all came largely through him. I can say the same for graduate school. I have a funny story about graduate school, but I, you know, I went to Harvard and when I first got there, you know, like any college application, I don't know how they work now, but at the time you sent in a paper application and you wrote your, um, letter statement or whatever that they asked you to write about something so I talked about Oakland California which was where I grew up after I lived with my moved with, with my dad when I was a teenager um and I talked about it's so embarrassing now like I would throw that burn it in gar burn it in a fire now pyre now but I started off saying Oakland Coakland Jokeland like to some people Oakland is a joke but to me it's my home and I'd go and talk about Oakland right um and I grew up in the, sub, in the middle class to affluent parts of Oakland, although we lived in the hood uh, when my dad was with his second wife. But, um, you know, whatever. Oakland was my home. Oakland is a very multi multicultural place. It still is now, but it was much, even much more when I was a child. Um, and I talked about how my transition from studying environmental studies where I did uh, focus on, what did I study? Oh, historical sites important to African-American history in Oakland. I did a tour. Um, I created a tour of Oakland. Um, and then I got to graduate school. I hadn't declared any particular interest, but I wrote, I guess, in the statement about what I was interested in, which was cities. I was, I was always interested um, in I used to say, this is the land. Okay, where's my hand? It's always reversed on this thing. And I was always interested in where the people were in the in the land. So I didn't study trees and stuff when I did environmental studies. I studied where people were. So then I studied urban planning as for my doctorate because I was like, I guess I care where the people in the cities interact with each other. So that's what I wrote about. And the department um, connected me with uh, an economist who's extremely famous. I think he was um, nominated for a Nobel Prize. And he was, this was before Harvard had a black studies department. It was just a committee at that time. So we met. I didn't really know who he was. I was very mm, ignorant slash arrogant <laughs> at the time. Uh, and so I, I didn't know who they, we didn't have uh, LinkedIn or Wikipedia or whatever, just Google people. So I just went in to meet this guy. I knew he was famous, but I didn't, didn't really mean anything to me. I wasn't familiar with his work or anything, um, on any deep level. And he, we sit down and he says to me, um, well, I know you're, uh, I know you're interested in, uh, black studies and I'm like one of the chairs of the committee on black studies here at Harvard. So I know you'll have things to work on and blah, blah, blah. And I just sat there and listening to him like, what the f is this guy talking about? I didn't say anything about black anything in my letter. I talked about poverty, which was more interesting to me at the time, which is what I ended up writing about ultimately. But I'd never said anything about black other than Oakland and showing up with my black ass face <laughs> in his office I probably checked off black on a box on my application so they probably knew I'm assuming um and so I listened to him and I said okay thank you so much and I literally went directly to my department I said you're gonna have to find me a new advisor because there's no way I'm working with this guy I don't give a probably didn't curse in the office I don't give a hoot who he is or how famous he is 
I never said anything about black anything. And for him to assume that that was my interest based on <clears throat> my appearance or what he assumed for what he read about me is unacceptable. And I'm not interested in writing about black things. And so they found me another advisor, Tony Gomez Abanez, who I love and will love forever and I'm eternally grateful for him, who was also an economist and a transportation guy. I didn't give a damn about transportation either, but we got along immediately. And this white man sounds, he sounds like he could be Latino. He is not, he is a white from Spain type Spanish named person. American, but his people come from Spain, not from Latin America, um, was the kindest, most generous, most supportive, most encouraging, created the most opportunities for me of anybody in my life and changed the trajectory of my life. I'm pretty sure I would have finished Harvard either way, but he made it easy. He made it easy for me to do so by facilitating my interests, letting me do what I wanted to do, he also <laughs> rented me a car, so I went back to California to write my dissertation, do my dissertation work, and I was living with my mom uh, in Marin, and she didn't have a car, so we were on the bus a lot, and then he happened to be coming out to UC Berkeley with his wife for a sabbatical for a year, about halfway through my year of field work, and rented me a car, which like changed my whole experience and ability to do things there. Um, to conduct my work. But this person was instrumental in my development as a thinker, um, encouraging me to study what I wanted. And when he retired, uh, it was during the pandemic because we had a Zoom retirement party for him. So maybe 2021, something like that. Um, hundreds of people showed up on the Zoom to talk about what an amazing scholar he is, what an amazing colleague he is, what an amazing advisor he was, and all that stuff. And so the his retirement party on Zoom went on for a couple hours. And so I got to speak uh, at some point in the second hour, and um, I started to cry. <laughs> I started crying, and I said, you changed my life. You showed me so much care and so much love, and you and your wife supported me so much even just having me over for dinner to talk about ideas or support me or encourage me um, through this experience that I didn't find hard, but it's long. So doing a PhD is like running a marathon. If you're equipped to do it, you can do it, but you do have to, sorry, tearing up, thinking about him, um, but you do have to be tough and have a lot of endurance. Um, and he stuck with me that whole time. Um, and I said, you mean everything to me. I'm so grateful to you. Um, and then this is after like people who, again, have been Nobel Prize winners and heads of MTAs and like international people had been speaking about him and his greatness for like an hour plus. Um, and then he says, you're going to make me start crying. And he tears up and he says in front of all these people, um, you know, Elisa, won, Elisa wrote one of the best three dissertations I've ever advised in my 40-year career here at Harvard, and that just blew me away. So white men have opened many doors for me, and I cannot deny that, and I would never. I'd say the one person in my professional career who supported me and helped me uh, get promoted and move up in the company once I had finished grad school and was working in my first job, which was my only job, because I was there for 15 years, 16 years, before I became an entrepreneur, um, was also a white man, Jewish guy, who believed in me. Um, I think the few times that I felt believed in, in all those times I was at that job, were um, when white men opened doors for me. So I can be highly critical of them, and I can appreciate them, and I also want to recognize the fact that white men supported me is also um, a result of white supremacy because they also are in positions of power more than anybody else. So if anyone can open the door and probably not feel particularly threatened by you, it's a white man. Like if he chooses to see your value and promote you, he probably can because he's likely to be in a position of power 
which is partly based on the uh, the rails being greased uh, in their favor their whole lives. So I can say all that about white men. Um, they've been terrific supporters for me later in life when I started fooling with men in heterosexual relationships, which are the only kind I've ever had, unfortunately. Um, you know, I've had white men as boyfriends and lovers too, not many, but some. And the thing I realized once I, because I only had ex dated black men for a, a long time in my younger years, but once I finally went white, I realized, oh, they're just like every other man. <laughs> like men are just like men. They're just all, they have more in common than they have difference by race, which makes sense since race is a fake construct, but, <laughs> and gender is something else to deal with. Um, so I know them up close and, uh, I also, I think knowing them up close and personal also just right sizes them for me. And I said that, I guess, in the first episode where I talked about whiteness in general and how if you form your identity around um, white supremacy in a way that makes you feel bad, then white people and their power seems much bigger than, like in my case, it didn't because I was up right up with them and I was like, oh, this is regular. So um, it can make me, it can sort of go both ways and that's how it's gone with me. So I think it's important to talk directly about white men, white people. Uh, I talk about black people too, sure, anybody. But I think it's in particular important to talk about them, to look at them, to study them, to explore them, to examine them, to understand them, to have compassion for them too because they've been conditioned in the same society that we have, which, um, if you're a black person watching this, just on the other side of the coin. So they don't necessarily even know better. Like I met a white woman, did I talk about this last time? <clears throat> There's an older white lady at the church I attend. I, I'm not religious, wasn't really raised religious and actually go to a Unitarian church, which is not religious either, here in Michigan because I didn't know anybody when I got here. And I was like, I gotta find some people because what the hell. So I had been to a Unitarian church with a white man back in New Jersey and I liked generally what they did which they talk about community and ethics and stuff without like throwing religion religious Christian religious doctrine right in your face um and so they're very progressive and they want to do better they want to do good so there's a in the church that I attend here in Michigan there's like an anti-racist group they try to do a lot of different things. They visit and patronize black owned restaurants. They have a reading group, they do other stuff. And this nice white lady with who's, and everybody there's old, like in their seventies plus, which is I think a grain of religion in general, like a lot of old people there. But anyway, um, I have a lot of nerve, but anyway, it's not all white. <laughs> um, so I was talking to one of the ladies who was at the anti-racism table one day during a sort of fair where they were talking about different programs at the church and her little cute little blue eyes and her little wrinkly face, she looked, she said, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. Like I read, I started reading these books and I, so it's been so eye opening. and she was so sincere. She meant it. She just didn't know because if you live in an all white bubble, and people are telling you you're great all the time and society's telling you you're great all the time and everybody's telling you everything's okay and those people are just whiners or whatever they're saying or like hollering nigger 15 times over right before dinner. I don't know what people do, white people do in their all white environments <laughs> around here. Like even though I've been around white people my whole life, I've always been black in those environments. So I cannot say that I know exactly what happens in all white environments because I that's like literally impossible. Um, so I say that to say that they don't know, literally don't know about racism in any real way lots of times. And we, and I think we spend a lot of time going, well, isn't it obvious? And that no, it's not to them. Like it's completely invisible. Their privilege is, is invisible to them. Um, the stories they've been told make it seem that their privilege is warranted and normal 
and plenty of white people work hard, so I'm not saying that they didn't work, but, uh, yeah, anyway, that's all I'll say about that. Um, what else can I say? So I think it's important to talk about whiteness and write W-H-I-T-E. I don't need to put a Y in it. It's not necessary. Um, yes, white people are fragile. Yes, they often cannot deal with this stuff. They're not used to it. It's upsetting. It concerns them. They don't, they feel uncomfortable. They feel guilty. They want to shy away. They have little motivation to deal with it. But I still think we, or at least I will, I think we need to feel comfortable addressing it directly. But I think, like I said last week, it's important to look at racism, I guess how I've been couching it in this way, as a tool, as a conditioning element, and not look at it personally, even though it is personal. Like I talked about last week, if I walk around this neighborhood that I live in and I feel like, are these white folks going to run me over with their truck just for the fun of it and get away with it? That's not good. I shouldn't have to think that. But, you know, so it's sort of a balancing of the reality of racism while understanding the non-power of race and how that's a made-up construct, I think, is how I can say that most easily. I'm looking at my notes. Oh, something that, I, that came up for me recently, too, was... Um, thinking about, I guess I touched on this last week, how it's like when we as people of color are forced to spend a lot of our energy just in defense and in establishing our validity as human beings and saying what we, what we think matters and our life experience matters and blah, 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 that we don't get to actually live our potential because we're spending our time on issues that are about our melanin or how our hair grows or or what our value is in society and blah 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 that it that ignores the historical roots of it right and so i said i've been saying this lately i said i would hope i never have to talk about racism and race again i hope I would never have to talk about gender discrimination and sexism again. Do you think I want to spend my life talking about this? <laughs> I don't. I like to paint. I like to create. I like to make new businesses. I like to be supportive. I like to create progress. I like to do things um, that are not that. But I'm willing to do it. I am doing it, obviously. But do you think... I said the reason that people of color, black people in particular, because that's what I like to talk about. And women have to talk about sexism and have to talk about anti-black racism is because they exist and they impede our ability to live like I just described on our own terms, doing what we want, being creative, crocheting something or doing so, I don't know, whatever the hell we want to do. When those things are impeded and interfered with because of systems or choices of individuals who choose to group us, stereotype us, and apply discriminatory practices, then we have to waste our time talking about this stuff. I bet every, if you really, there are a lot of people who make their bread and butter from racism, for sure, and anti-racism too. And so maybe they've made a career of it, and so it's worth continuing to talk about. But I'd say most people would love it if you really presented it to them to never have to speak about these things again because they didn't exist. So, my kid's calling me. I'll figure that out in a minute. Um, yeah, so I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. This is long enough. We're almost 30 minutes. Yeah, wrap it up. So, I'm Dr. Elisa Gardenhire. Thanks for watching last time. Like and subscribe, as they say. Share this video with a friend um, and reach out to me. You've got comments or you want to tell me something, leave a comment below. Throw a thumbs up, a like. Does this thing make a thumbs up again? Last time I did this, it like made a thumbs up, which was kind of funny. Um, anyway, that's it. I'm Dr. Elisa Gardenhire, and I appreciate you watching. See you next time.